Hi everyone, this is Arkady Frechtman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney and welcome to Last Week Tonight where we answer your questions and we talk about your comments. So this is going to be an interesting one. We're going to look at the community section. Now it's called community before it was just comments, but it's good because, you know, we are building a community. And let's see what people are talking about when they watch our videos and what questions people have. So the first question I see is just from five hours ago and it's from Joy. And she says, I have had a slip and fall with a major supermarket that happened in Georgia. Who can you recommend as a trial lawyer for my case, please? And thank you. Yeah, so I think the best thing to do would be to text me. It's 347-566-9595. And then, you know, when you text me, just include your name, brief facts. Just tell me a little bit of information about your case. Like, what's it about? What caused you to fall? Just one or two sentences. Tell me a little bit about your injury. Did you break your leg? Do you have surgery? Did you have a herniated disc? You know, just so I have an idea. Just also one sentence. And then maybe tell me, well, you did tell me your city and your state, right? And then I could text you back. We could schedule a time for a free confidential consultation. And once we do the consultation, then I'm happy to do some research and find out who the best lawyer could be for you. Uh, I do know some excellent premises liability lawyers in Georgia. In fact, this week I was chatting with one of them and he sent me some samples for a case I'm working on here in New York. Um, but yeah, we, we have similar laws. Uh, so maybe he could be the right lawyer for you, maybe someone else. But I'd really want to speak with you first before we give that kind of uh, decision out. You know, we don't want to do it just not based on a YouTube comment. So yeah, just, just feel free to reach out. And Richie says, hey, how are you? I have a $556,000 doctor bill and a million dollar policy, a fusion surgery with disc replacement in the neck, recommended surgery in the future. Case is set for trial in April. My date to see the defense doctor in December, case value question mark. Will that be over the million ride share insurance? Yeah, I mean, look, if you have 500,000, over 500,000 just in your medical bills, right? And it's only a million dollar policy. The first thing I would do is I would make sure to request whether there's any umbrella or excess beyond that million. If it's ride share like Uber, they could have many layers. So you could have a million, then have another like five, five million, then have another layer. It's like peeling back the onion. You want to get all those layers. You know, that's very, very critical because yeah, if you have 556,000 just in your medical bills, of course, then your injury could be worth many, many millions. And especially since you have a fusion surgery with a disc replacement and you have a future recommended surgery. So what I would do there is I would look at all the different types of damages. Look, you have future medical expenses, like the need for future surgery, but it's not just going to be the future surgery. It's also going to be prescriptions, physical therapy, you know, chiropractic visits, visits to the orthopedic, uh, you know, everything's going to add up. Like one physical therapy session can cost a few hundred dollars and you might need three every week. And I don't know your age, you know, people live to be like 83 on average. So you might have 50 more years of that, you know, and that could cost like $5 million just in the future medicals. And plus you might have lost wages, the paycheck losses. I don't know how much those are. We need to get an economist. And then of course, the most valuable component of the case, the most, uh, you know, the thing that's worth the most are the non-economic damages, which are the pain and suffering and the loss of enjoyment of life. But in order to put a number on that, we have to know what, how your injury has affected your ability to do the things you love and your relationships with the people that you love in your life. So we want to talk to, you know, if you, if you're married or have kids, have friends, coworkers, and, you know, do a deeper dive. So maybe your lawyer is doing all this right already. So if they are, then they should be able to hit for millions and millions of dollars but a lot of lawyers are not. And they're just kind of like going through the motions and they don't have any kind of biography on you. They don't know anything about you, anything about your family. They don't have an expert for lost wages and no economist. They don't have any kind of future medicals, right? They don't have a doctor giving you future medicals or an economist calculating future medicals. So then they don't have anything on any of this. And they're just hoping the insurance company is going to call them up and just give them money, which, you know, money doesn't usually fall from the sky. Um, so, it just depends on how they build it up, whether they build it up the proper way. But yeah, definitely it has the potential to be a huge case. 
Honey Touch says, this attorney who won this verdict is really talented, definitely top in New York City, but I believe you are just as good. Oh, and she's referring to the case I did about $120 million uh, win in a personal injury lawsuit. It would be great if you also have some of your arguments, opening statements, and summations online. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm happy to do that. I, I've been doing videos about some of my cases, like the, the one we did for $2.2 million recently, the settlement in the Bronx, the one we did for $3.5 million last summer in the Bronx, but I have a few other trials coming up. In New York, unfortunately, they don't let us record, uh, so we can't do like the CBN, the Courtroom View Network, like you do in other states where you can actually watch the trials. But, you know, I'll do my best to uh, get some transcripts and to get some more information for you. But thank you. I really appreciate that. And then come along with Uncle Joe says, what is an alternative dispute resolution packet? Yeah, so alternative dispute resolution is basically like mediation or arbitration. So when you go to one of those, you're going to have a packet. And the packet is basically going to tell the judge what this case is all about, like a little summary. What's the liability? Why are the defendants to blame? What are your injuries? You might want to have you know, of course, all your medical diagnoses, the same thing, right? You might wanna have your paycheck losses, like all your lost wages, whatever damages you're gonna be claiming at trial, and then why, you know, if you're asking, let's say for a million dollars, why that's justified, why you believe you wanna have other verdicts, or cases similar to yours, basically whatever you wanna show the judge to make your case, to make your argument, why they should pay you your number. So that's basically what it is. It's just like a settlement uh, package, but it's called an ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, because it's for the mediation or for the arbitration. Come along with Uncle Joe also asks, if the other side asks for a demand letter, does that mean there's not going to be a deposition? No, not necessarily. I mean, if they're asking for a demand letter, it means that they're interested in settling, but you don't know, right? It could be real interest where they're actually interested in settling your case. So they're saying, send us a demand letter. Let's talk Turkey. Let's get this case resolved. That could be good faith. So if you send them the demand letter and you say, okay, I want a million dollars, they could turn around and say, look, we have 500,000 for you. Let's go to a mediation. Let's bridge the gap. Let's get this settled. Or they could say a million dollars. That's too high. Our offer on this is 15,000. And, you know, and, and basically then your letter is all just a waste of time. But I would not stop the uh, litigation process because you think they're going to settle. Remember, you don't, you know, think that they're going to be fair. Don't think that they're going to negotiate in good faith and just pay you money. You have to make them pay. So you could have both channels, right? Both roads going at the same time. Basically, you could do your depositions, do your IMEs, whatever you need to do, put it on the trial calendar. Remember, the, the best way to get paid is to show them you're ready and you're gonna go to trial and you're gonna get it from a jury. But while you're pursuing all that, sure, if you wanna schedule a side mediation, let's, let's go to a mediation. If you want me to send you a demand letter, here's my letter, let's talk, call me, let's negotiate. You know, you could do both at the same time. There's no reason to stop the case thinking they're gonna be fair and pay you. And then if they're not fair and they lowball you and they give you like a thousand bucks, now, now you lost a year on your case. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So you could do both at the same time. Powell says, if the new government pursues tort reform, will that make a difference in workers' comp and truck accident suits already filed? I mean, it could make a difference. The most important thing is like, you know, if the, if the government, you know, we have a new president, obviously. So if the government is gonna be more like pushing tort reform, the problem is that they could put caps on damages. Usually it doesn't apply to existing cases, like any kind of new law where they have caps on damages, which some states do have, would only apply to future cases. You can't make the law usually, they don't make it retroactive. But the entire feeling, right, if most people believe in caps and most people believe in tort reform, then it's going to be harder to pick a fair jury that's going to be willing and able to give you and allow for millions and millions of dollars for a life-changing forever injury. So depending on how things go, but we, we had this president before, right, for four years, and we were able to actually see very significant verdicts. There were some verdicts for like, you know, 50 million, 100 million. So I, I don't think it's anything to worry about. And then David says, how do you know when a case is a full policy limit case? Yeah, so I mean, it's really just comes with judgment and experience. Like for example, if you have a really serious injury like a fusion, but you have a limited policy like 100,000, well, clearly that's a policy limits case. Now, if you have the same uh, injury, but you have a million, I think that's still a policy limits case because usually a fusion surgery is just worth way more. But you know, if you have on the flip side, if you have a soft tissue injury where someone just gets chiropractic care and they have like one bulge 
and they don't do anything, right? No injections, no surgery, but you have, you know, let's say a million dollar policy. Well, that's not a policy limits case, but you could still send a settlement opportunity letter. You could still try to get maybe like 30,000, 50,000, the most you can get for a case like that, but that's more of a soft tissue. So usually a policy limits case is going to be a permanent injury, a significant injury, and a life-changing like forever injury. So something like, you know, a brain injury, a fusion surgery, it could be a burn injury, uh, some kind of scarring, something really serious. And you want to have the policy, whatever the policy is, the lower the policy with the serious injury, the more likely they're going to have to tender, right? The higher the policy, if you're looking at like a policy of about 25 million, well, then you really have to have like catastrophic injuries to get the tender for something like that. So it just depends, but it's more of a judgment call for your lawyer and, and you too. You, you and your lawyer should make that decision together about what amount you're going for. And uh, let's see, here's a question from PVS Sport. How about a residential slip and fall in the Bronx with the following from an MRI? And then they list a bunch of MRI injuries like L3, L4, for a minor impingement, L4, L5. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that could have value. Those injuries have value, but they'll you have even more value if you end up doing something for them, like having pain management, like an epidural injection, radiofrequency ablation, percutaneous discectomy, or if they need full-blown surgery. Because just having an injury in an MRI is something. It shows that you have a medical diagnosis, but it's not enough to be able to tell you what your case is worth. I would also need to know what was the cause of your slip and fall? What's the liability? What's the insurance policy? You know, how old are you? So it's best to text me or we could do a, a consult call and then I could maybe give you uh, more information. And, and I've also been like looking up people's cases. If they text me their name or their index number, I could look it up in the court's public filing and then I can give you more specifics about your case um, as well as some people have an attorney. They're not sure. You know, some people don't even know who their attorney is if they're one of these big firms. So I could look up maybe the attorney and give you an email showing, hey, what are the verdicts and settlements for this individual? And then you could see, hey, it's really good. I have somebody who's gotten million dollar verdicts or, hey, maybe I have somebody who's never been to court or somebody who went to court and got like $2,000. That's maybe not so good. You know, so whatever, whatever it turns out to be, but I'm happy to help. Here's a question from Hope Humbled. The two defendants in the case have both changed attorneys three times. Is that good or bad? Why would they need to change that many times? Well, yeah, it's hard to say exactly. Usually the way it works is the insurance company picks the defense firm. If they have in-house counsel, then that in-house counsel does it for them. If they feel like the case is a little bit more of a high value case where they have potential exposure and they might have to pay a lot of money, they might say, this isn't one for in-house counsel. Let's get like a real defense law, law firm that's going to really go to trial and try to preclude things and, you know, make motions and motions in limine and this and that you know, more of like a power, power firm on it. So, but if they're changing multiple times, it might not be because they're afraid your case is a, a huge case. It might just be because one firm is saying, look, we're going to charge you less money because remember they have to pay these law, law firms by the hour. So if one lawyer is charging, let's say $300 an hour, but another one says, you know what, I could do this for 175. They'll say, oh, why don't we switch over to this other firm? We'll save a lot of money. You know, so it could be something internal like that. It's hard to say just from the comment what it could be. And then Brendan says, I was rear-ended by a fourth offender, drunk driver, BAC.24, workers comp, 1 million auto insurance on the drunk's car. I had to have my forehead reconstructed from the damage and now going in for an L4, L5 fusion and laminectomy. Can you ever, have you ever seen a settlement amount on cases similar to this? And if so, what were some of the outcomes? Yeah, no, I'm really sorry to hear that. I mean, that's crazy. I think if it's a 1 million uh, policy, you should be able to get the full policy because if you have a major surgery to get your forehead reconstructed, that's, that's terrible. And then also have an L4, L5 fusion. I'd need to know like what city you're in, a little bit more information, like your age, whether you have lost wages, whether you have future medicals, which you probably will have with an injury like that. And also the most important thing, make sure you have a trial attorney handling the case, somebody who's gotten you know millions and millions of dollars from juries before so that they're confident and they're able to do it in your case again. And make sure that you find out if it's only a million or if they have excess and umbrella. Because a lot of the times they'll tell you, oh, we don't have any excess or we don't know about any excess, but in reality they have it. So you have to do a deeper digging to find out that excess. 
And like I've had cases of my own that I've talked about before where I've taken over a case from another attorney and the attorney has had the case for like three, four years. And the attorney not only never asked if there was excess, they, I mean, they never even asked if there was excess, but when they did ask, the other side just said, you know, no. Uh, or, or even when we tried to get it, they, they just kind of tried to stall it and say, look, uh, you know, we don't need to tell you because the prior attorney never asked. So it's already like this case is already going to be under a million. We said, no, no, no. We kept prying it, make, make a motion for it, ask the judge. And then we find out, wait a minute, there's a million, but there's 25 million excess beyond that. So you have to do a deep dig. And now in a lot of states, including New York, they have to tell you automatically all the insurance, meaning primary and excess umbrella. So I'm thinking, you know, if it's a individual car, if the drunk was just driving a private car, like, you know, his own Toyota Camry or whatever, his personal car, yeah, it might only be a million. But if it's like any kind of company, commercial, trucking, usually those might have excess or umbrella, but look, look it up anyway. But yeah, if it's only a million, I think you clearly, that's a, that's a clear tender with all those injuries. William says, Arcady, thank you for always showing up. We appreciate you. Thumbs up as always. My question is, can you list insurance companies dealing from hardest to deal with to best to deal with when handling settlements? Lastly, what percentage of cases actually go to trial? Best guessed from your experience. Again, thank you. Yeah, so I think in terms of going to trial, maybe about 95% of cases do not go to trial. So maybe like 5% or less do go to trial. Most cases settle. And in terms of insurance companies, I mean, there's so many of them, right? There's hundreds of them. So I've never done any kind of like analysis like that. You know, I don't do like statistics, but if you made a list, I mean, I know some of them that tend to be a little bit better, like some of the better ones could be like Hartford or Zurich or Chubb. Are, tend to be a little bit better, that they have bigger policies and they're more willing to pay. And then some other ones, like we had American Transit here in New York, they're known as very cheap. Now they're going, I think, into some kind of liquidation where they, they don't have any money. They're going to cease to function, which could be a good thing. Uh, countrywide was always cheap. I mean, sometimes uh, carriers go through like different, you know, stages. Like at one point, Geico was good and they were paying, like on soft tissue cases, they were paying like 30 grand, but then Geico got cheap or Allstate, at one point Allstate was really, really cheap and they never paid on anything, but then they changed a little bit and then they started to pay. So they go through these like ebbs and flows, so it's hard to say, but definitely there's, you know, there is a rhythm to it with some carriers getting cheap and some carriers being more um, willing to pay. But remember that only matters if you just wanna settle and if you're just gonna pick up the phone, but if you're willing to, you know, push the case and really go to court, then it doesn't really matter because then you set the number. You tell them, hey, this is what justice is in this case. And if they don't pay it, then you go to a jury and you get it and you make them pay. So it doesn't really matter. Melquan says, in your expert opinion, if a policy is 500,000 and medical bills are over 70,000 with three injections included, plus about two years of physical therapy, and the case is three years old, recommended for a two level lower back fusion and liability is in my favor. Does 225,000 to 300,000 sound reasonable as a settlement or can I expect lower because I did not get the surgery yet? I'm actually suing for medical damages, losing my propensity to earn and pain and suffering. Probably it's worth more. I mean, look, if the policy is 500, your medical bills are already 70. So that's a chunk of it, right? You're going to sue for your medical bills, but also you're going to sue for your future medical bills. So you'd want to have a doctor and an economist talk about that but you've had injections and you've had two years of physical therapy uh, and then you need this fusion. So even if you don't have the fusion, you could say, look, but I need the fusion. So I'm going to have it at some point, maybe not now, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years, but I'm going to have it. You know, I don't know your age, but you put that in that you're going to have it. The cost of the fusion is usually like 70,000 by itself, right? So then that adds to the medicals. It also adds to the pain and suffering because you have to have this major surgery. And remember, when you have a fusion at one level, or you said two level, but like when you have it at two levels, let's say, let's say, and you said lower, right? So let's say it's L3, L4, L4, L5, for example. But then remember, you're going to have something known as adjacent segment disease, which is also medically known to occur. And it's um, then you're going to need a fusion at the lower level, L5, S1, and at the upper level, because you have two adjacent levels, you know, the one below and the one above. So then you have another 140, right? 70 and 70 for that. So yeah, it could, it could totally be worth that. I mean, 300,000, it could probably be worth the full 500 if you have a good trial lawyer who's willing to take it to court 
and is aggressive? Absolutely. I don't see why not. And then uh, Richie says, hey, I was wondering if it's normal for the defense doctor to reschedule. And is that the cause of my trial date getting pushed back or rescheduled? Um, well, if it's just an IME, usually they don't reschedule unless it's some kind of problem. Either they don't have enough information. Like if you're still going to do like another surgery, they don't want to do the IME because it's premature because then they'll want to do another one after the surgery. So they might just wait and do one. But usually they don't reschedule unless something happened with the doctor. He's not available. But it shouldn't really delay your case too much. Uh, I don't know what jurisdiction you're in. You know, each, each venue is a little bit different, but it shouldn't really matter too much. Brad says, Mr. Freckman is absolutely the best. He not only runs his firm, creates content, and does free consults, he also refers out to great attorneys and follows up on them just to provide value. I did a consult with him last week and now on track to get a much better attorney. Thank you, Mr. Freckman, for all you do. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that was a really nice man, uh, I believe, down south. We spoke and I was trying to help him. Yeah, he had a, a problem with his case and I'm hoping to find someone good to, to be able to partner with to really help him but I think uh, hopefully we'll be successful. It should be, should be a good case. And Alberto says, uh, hi, Arcady, if you're approved by Social Security and you get a settlement from an accident um, and there's an account for funding that you put your settlement, so the check from Social Security, does it get affected from the settlement? How do you get the money from the account? That is my question. I'm just trying to apply for Social Security and the lawyer told me if I get a settlement, my lawyer from the settlement has to open an account. I don't remember how they called. Oh, I see what you're saying, right? So if you have social security, depending on what type of social security, if it's like a type of disability, you might not be able to receive a big uh, you know, monetary settlement for your personal injury case. Cause I think that might be, some of it may be need based, right? So if you don't, you know, if you get a big windfall, like a million dollars and they're gonna say, well, now you don't have a need. So they're gonna get rid of your social security. So there are some lawyers that practice like trusts and estates. So they could probably open up a special account where the money goes into a trust. And then you have a trustee that's almost like an administrator or a secretary that, um, you know, uh, takes care of the trust. And then when you need money from that, you can take it or the trustee could take it and give it to you. But it's a separate account and it's considered, you know, separate from you receiving it because you can't receive it if you have the social security. So you don't want to lose your benefits. So there, there are ways to do that. You have to speak to a trust attorney about that. But yeah, there are definitely ways to do that. And New York Bethia says, I've been waiting to hear back from the insurance adjuster and she has not responded to me at all. What do I do? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the, all the facts and circumstances. If you're trying to settle the case yourself and then, you know, that's kind of difficult. You might want to speak to an attorney and then the attorney could help you. And uh, probably the attorney can get you more compensation. And then he also says, this part is more of the car adjuster side for payment of my car. I do have a personal injury lawyer, but he wanted to wait till I got my first offer for my car before announcing that he is involved. Hmm, that's weird. I don't know why they would do that. I mean, they could actually help you. If they're a lawyer, they could actually help you with the property damage. Usually we do that for free and don't charge a fee for that. Um, this is my first car accident and my car is totaled. My nose is broken, my hip and other things are involved as well. Some guy ran a stop sign and hit me. I'm just confused with a lot of this. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry to hear that. I think it's a, you know, sounds like a strong case, but feel free to text me. I'm happy to do a consult with you, 347-566-9595. They should just pay you really, if it's not your fault. And Mr. Carter says, hey, sorry I missed the live, but here's my question. Is it common for the defense to accept full liability, but not make any offers? My case is scheduled for trial in December. My accident was in 2020. My treatment includes physical therapy, epidurals, branch blocks, an RFA, that's a radio frequency ablation, and a lumbar laminotomy and discectomy. Commercial policy, 1 million policy limit. Is this a stall tactic? Yeah, so I mean, if they're admitting liability, so you have that, I don't know if you filed a motion for summary judgment, that is a good idea. So you get a judgment as a matter of law, then they have to usually pay interest. And then the only question becomes your damages and your damages sound serious. Yeah, like a back surgery and all this pain management. I think you have a shot at taking the full million or getting a high settlement in the high six figures, you know, especially for that laminotomy and discectomy. I don't really know why it could be because of a lot of different things, right? It could be because they think that the injuries were not caused by this crash. It could be just a stall tactic. 
It could be because they're not afraid of the attorney handling the case and they think they're not really going to go to trial. They're just going to try to settle. There's a lot of different, you know, possibilities. I'd need to speak with you, but feel free to text me as well and we could we could jump on a call. And Barga says, I need an estimate for my injury. The accident happened on August 16th. There are injuries on my knees, which healed after 15 to 20 days of the accident. But there is injury on my foot, which is still there. I have took uh, MRIs and it says bone contusion and joint fluid. I'm still feeling pain. How much can I settle with the insurance in this case? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. The best thing to do would be to text me again because it's just too general for me to answer because I'd have to know specifically what the injuries are, you know, um, and I'd have to know like what happened, who's at fault, how much insurance there is, what's your age, whether you have lost wages, whether you have future medicals, whether you just have pain and suffering. But if the accident just happened on August 16th, um, you know, you you have time. If you have an, an attorney, definitely speak with them. Make sure they're doing the right thing and you have the right attorney building it up. But um, the injury that goes away by itself, that's not going to be worth much. But anything permanent is going to be uh, worth a lot more. And then we did another video where we re reacted to an opening statement. We actually played the opening statement. It was on CBN in a different state. And that result was like 500 million. And Charles says, obviously, the case will go to the appeals court and could be vacated. There's a sort of Pyrrhic victory in all of this. And of course, the innocent suffer. Yeah, I mean, sometimes when you get a high verdict, it could be reduced or um, vacated. But sometimes out west, especially, they, they, they keep the verdicts, too. Uh, New York is a little bit tougher to keep the really, really high verdicts. Here's a question from Nayslayer. Could you please do a comprehensive video on punitive verdicts with examples? It's so confusing to a lot of us. Most attorneys say punitive is too hard, but the drunk driver who hit me had a BAC of 0.27 and pleaded guilty, and now I need ACDF, which is, which is anterior cervical discectomy infusion. How the heck does it not qualify? Thanks. Yeah, I can do some videos about that. I mean, usually if they are doing something that is so reckless that it's gonna hurt, that it's likely to hurt the general uh, population and it's malicious and they're doing it with malice, it could be uh, punitive. And actually, um, I actually have a book uh, here all about punitive damages. I think I mentioned it before. I started looking at it. I've been a little busy, but I want to start, I want to go through it. And then, yeah, this is all about punitive damages. And we could actually maybe analyze the book together and talk about the elements. But they talk about how to make, how to add punitives to more cases. Because, yeah, a lot of lawyers do say it's too hard and they, they don't even try for punitives. Well, guess what? If you don't try, you're not going to get it. You have to try and then hopefully at one point you will succeed. But punitives essentially are meant to punish the wrongdoer, punish them so they don't do that again. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. This was a great episode of Last Week Tonight. We got a lot of interesting comments, a lot of vital information for personal injury cases. Remember, we're here. Our goal is helping serious injury victims and families. If you need a consult, just text me, 347-566-9595. Include your name, Tell me a little bit about your case, just what happened, one or two sentences, your injury, your city, and then I'm happy to schedule a consult. And please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what videos you want to see next as we're preparing and shooting more content for you. And all the best, everyone. Stay safe out there and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.